deliberating the ethics of eating meat, a Christian might argue that it's all right to eat animals because even God provided animals for the Israelites to eat in the wilderness. I've heard it asked, but didn't God give the Israelites quail to eat? As if to say that if God provided meat for ancient Israelites while they wandered the desert, then it must be all right for us to eat meat today. In the Torah, we find two accounts where God is said to have given the Israelites quail to eat. But with closer inspection, the text reveals that it wasn't God's desire. It was the desire of the people to eat meat. The text also reveals that it wasn't God's ideal for the people to eat meat. And just like many today, the people desired meat for the wrong reasons, overindulged, and caused suffering. Both of the accounts of the Israelites eating quail are from a time when Israel was traveling through the wilderness after being liberated from slavery in Egypt. The first account occurs on the 15th day of the second month, or one month after the Passover event and leaving Egypt. This account is found in Exodus 16. Here we read, The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Notice here the background information. The Israelites were just liberated from bitter slavery a month earlier and led out of Egypt by Moses and Aaron, God's representatives to the community. And now, instead of being pious and thankful, they are grumbling against Moses and Aaron and essentially grumbling against God, who Moses and Aaron act on the behalf of. Also notice that the Israelites state that they are craving flesh pots or meat. And this is the first time meat is mentioned in the text, not by God, but by the Israelites as they complained, basically saying that they'd prefer slavery in Egypt to walking with and trusting in God in the wilderness without the foods they had become accustomed to. There's a parallel here with Jesus' 40 days of fasting in the wilderness recorded in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4. Jesus, after 40 days, had become very hungry, yet he didn't put food above doing the will of God. Jesus quoted Deuteronomy 8.3, which was a reference to the Israelites' time in the wilderness, and said, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The Israelites had not yet learnt this lesson. Instead of trusting God and humbly approaching Him for help, they in a sense rejected what God had done for them by lamenting being out of Egypt and saying they'd rather be dead. However, God had compassion on the Israelites and revealed a plan to relieve their hunger and sustain them. God tells Moses that He will miraculously provide food for them. We read in Exodus 16.4, Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. God responds to their complaints graciously by telling Moses that he will miraculously provide bread for them to eat. And by telling the Israelites to only gather enough for each day, God is inviting the Israelites to learn to trust him better, to trust in him each day for what they need, and essentially inviting the Israelites to walk with him and build a deeper relationship with him so he can teach them his ways. Here's something I didn't notice before re-looking into this narrative. When Moses shares with the Israelites what the Lord had said to him about providing bread from heaven, Moses says something different from what the Lord originally said according to the text. Moses says that the Lord will provide meat, or basar, in the evening, and bread, or lachem, in the morning, where originally the Lord said that he would provide bread from heaven each day. Either details weren't recorded by the author when the Lord spoke to Moses, perhaps knowing the details would be shared almost immediately in Moses' speech. Or perhaps something else is going on here. Perhaps because the Israelites originally asked for meat, and God said he would provide lachem, which is secondarily translated simply as food, Moses understood this food to include meat. Perhaps a proper meal in their minds at the time was plant-based in the morning and meat in the evening, and this was Moses' interpretation of daily food. Or perhaps because the people asked for meat and God said he'd provide food for the people, Moses assumed God meant meat. It is also possible 
that Moses added meat to the promise to appease the people. We can't know for sure why the narrative flows this way, from God saying bread, then Moses saying bread and meat. But we know for sure that God wasn't the first to mention meat in the text, and God originally said bread from heaven. I believe the text is already hinting that the meat wasn't God's idea or God's ideal, but this will become more clear by looking at the second account and the larger narrative. Interestingly, after Moses tells the people to expect meat in the evening and bread in the morning, God seems to confirm what Moses told the Israelites about the meat. If we understand that it wasn't God's original plan to provide meat, this change from God's promise to provide heavenly bread to God committing to provide bread and meat should be seen as divine accommodation to meet the people where they were at. Anabaptist theologian Greg Boyd describes God as a heavenly missionary to our fallen and often barbaric world, where God will take on the practices of the people in order to enter into community with them, and then from there move them forward toward a way closer to his way. Boyd says, God had to stoop as low as was necessary to embrace people as they were if he hoped to gradually transform them to become the people he wanted them to be. It's possible that it was this type of accommodation when God provided quail for the Israelites to eat, though his ideal was for them not to kill and for them to be sustained with manna. In verse 11, the text reads, The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I've heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So again, the people asked for meat, God originally said that he would provide bread, Moses then said meat and bread, and God then said meat and bread. God also qualifies the provisions with, I have heard the complaining, as if to say, I'm accommodating your desire. And God not, not only qualified the meat with hearing their complaint, but also with a greater purpose. God said, so they will know that I am God. In other words, he was providing the meat so that there was no doubt that he heard their specific lament, which would then increase their faith, allowing God to walk further with them and better reveal his ways onward into the future. From the structure of the narrative, we can infer that it wasn't God's idea to provide the meat, but God was committing to provide them with the meat they desired as an accommodation. The question of, didn't God provide quail for the Israelites to eat? cannot be realistically considered a counter-argument against veganism or ethical vegetarianism if one truly studies the narrative. By only reading a part where God says he will provide meat, it might seem that God condones killing animals. But thankfully, the wider narrative or context has a way of showing us that it wasn't God's ideal or God's idea to provide quail, but an accommodation for a fallen people. And if we retrace the narrative all the way back to before the fall, before we had a fallen people, in Genesis 1.29, we can see God's ideal diet for humankind was a vegan diet. And this is foundational when discussing ideals. I would also like to mention the work of Jewish scholar and rabbi Asa Kesar. For anyone interested in a Jewish perspective on God's ideal relationship between humankind and the animals, as revealed through the Torah. On review of this first account of the quail, we can't forget the Israelites were the first to mention meat and that God initially offers bread. Then Moses announces that God will provide meat and bread. Then God seemingly, for the sake of encouraging their walk with him, provides for them bread and the meat they desire. Though manna was God's original plan to sustain them, he accommodates them. To back up this idea of divine accommodation, we can look elsewhere in the Bible. For example, in 1 Samuel 8, after the Israelites had moved into the land of Canaan, the elders of Israel asked the prophet Samuel for a king. When Samuel prayed to God about the request, God responded by saying that by asking for a king, they were rejecting God as king. God then told Samuel to warn the people that a king of the type they were asking for would be demanding and oppressive. Samuel also warned Israel that if they were given a king, a day would come when they would cry out for relief from that king, but that they would have to live with the consequences of that decision. 
Nonetheless, the Israelites demanded to have a king to be like the nations around them. And in verse 22, the Lord tells Samuel to listen to them and give them a king. So God actually eventually commands Samuel to give Israel a king, though he didn't want them to have a king. Here we see that it wasn't God's idea or God's ideal. But if one just remembers God's command to Samuel to give Israel a king, they might think that it was all God's idea or God's ideal for Israel to have a king. One might even ask, didn't God tell Samuel to give Israel a king in defense of having a king in Israel? However, when looking at the narrative more thoroughly, we can see that God provides the Israelites with a king because that was what they desired and not because it was what God desired. A king was an accommodation, but now that that accommodation was provided, God would work through this accommodation in order to bring the people closer to him and his ways onward into the future. The quail in the desert can also be considered an example of God's accommodation, giving people what they desire, even if it doesn't reach God's ideal. Perhaps this wasn't completely clear after the first account, but it becomes more apparent after the second. At this point, the Israelites have been in the wilderness much longer, for approximately a year and two months, and they begin to complain yet again. Numbers 11.4 reads, The rabble among them had a strong craving, and the Israelites also wept again and said, If only we had meat to eat. They then go on to describe the variety of foods they had in Egypt and complain about the manna. We can note here that the manna had continued for years after the first account, but not the quail. This supports the idea that the quail was only an accommodation and not the ideal, for one continued while the other did not. Also, just like the first account where meat is brought up in the text, the Israelites are failing to be thankful for the gifts that God has given them. This time, they are not hungry, for they have manna, but they're not satisfied with God's provisions. They begin to crave other foods, including, including meat, and desire again to be back in Egypt rather than walk with God. The manna represents walking with and trusting God, where the meat represents their ungodly and unfaithful desires. The text continues. Moses, after hearing the wailing and complaining of every family at the entrance to his tent, himself complains to God for having to lead the people. Moses laments. They come weeping to me and say, Give us meat to eat. I'm not able to carry all these people alone, for they're too heavy for me. If this is the way you're going to treat me, put me to death at once. Moses in distress speaks of the wailing of the people for meat and asks God for help to alleviate the burden of leading them. Moses, perhaps in hyperbole, perhaps not, says he'd rather die than continue to lead the people alone. A request for death, whether it be hyperbole or in honesty, is a commonality in both accounts before quail are killed. In the first account, the Israelites also said they'd rather be dead than in, than in the situation they were in. It is perhaps not a coincidence that death is brought up and spoken of almost irreverently before death is brought upon the animals in both accounts. Life was to be considered sacred, as it was, like the manna also a gift from God, the one who gave breath to every living creature, or nefesh. And like all gifts, this gift could be squandered with great severity. In both cases, the people had walked with God through extraordinary and miraculous circumstances, and yet they were basically saying they didn't want to walk with God any further when they cried out for death. With this in mind, it may be that the quail that are killed represent a sort of sacrifice in order to maintain the walk between the Israelites and God. It could be argued that the quail die in order to keep the people from death or utter despair. And I don't mean that the people were going to literally die from malnutrition without the quail, as I believe God's heavenly manna would have been perfectly sufficient. I mean the people were losing sight of the greater picture and, though they may have spoken of death and hyperbole, were in reality close to spiritual death. Wrong ideas about who God was, about God's plan, God's provisions, about God's leader Moses, and about the past in Egypt had grown in their minds, keeping them from appreciating their blessings and making them desire and prefer ungodly things. Their communion with God was nearly broken because of their short-sightedness and wrong thinking. 
but God, unwilling to break that communion, met them where they were at, again giving them what they asked for, whether or not it met God's ideal, for the sake of continuing in, re in communion with them, in order to bring them closer to his ways. The quail were in a sense a sacrifice, not a formal Levitical sacrifice, but an act that, like a formal Levitical sacrifice, allows the people and God to continue walking together in communion. Ideally, the lives of the quail given, or taken rather, would increase the faith of the Israelites and bring the people closer to God, and in turn make the Israelites better representatives of God's ways, which would include better stewardship of God's creation, which would include not taking the lives of animals unnecessarily. Let's see how God responds this time. God answers Moses' lament for help by telling Moses that 70 of Israel's elders will help Moses lead the people, so Moses will not have to carry the burden alone. God also responds to the people's complaint about not having meat to eat. In Numbers 11, 16 to 21, we read, The Lord said to Moses, Say to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow you shall eat meat. For you have wailed in the hearing of the Lord, saying, If only we had meat to eat. Surely it was better for us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. You shall eat not only one day or two days or five days or ten or twenty days, but for a whole month, until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you, because you have rejected the Lord who is among you, and have wailed before him, saying, Why did we ever leave Egypt? It's interesting that God says for them to consecrate themselves before they are to eat meat. In Strong's Concordance, the word consecrate, or kadash, is defined as to be set apart and is previously seen in the creation narrative in regards to the Sabbath day as a day set apart for God. The word is also used in reference to the Passover and the firstborn being set apart for God. With this in mind, we can assume that the Israelites were to prepare themselves spiritually before this event when meat would be provided. Before eating meat, they were to be set apart be holy and be dedicated to God. This consecrating oneself, if done, would have perhaps reminded them that they were to follow God's ways and not their own selfish or ungodly desires. It might have even reminded them to be thankful for what was already provided, the manna. If done, this consecrating oneself would have perhaps also reminded them that the lives of the quail had value in God's eyes as part of God's creation, and perhaps might have kept them from taking more than they needed and from killing more than was actually necessary for survival. Beyond the command to consecrate oneself, there is also a pretty clear connection made that by asking for meat and longing to be in Egypt, the people were rejecting God. And if that wasn't enough to make them reconsider their desire for meat, there was a warning that they would learn to loathe meat. The narrative goes on, and it seems the warnings and the command to consecrate oneself were completely ignored. The quail returned, and unlike the first experience recorded with quail, where it would seem they were more disciplined or perhaps there were less quail, this time the quail came in numbers so large that they surrounded the camp as far as one could walk in any direction in a day. This time, they would have to use discretion, for the quail population was beyond what they could possibly eat. In verse 32, it says that they captured quail for an entire day, night, and the following day until each person had no less than 10 homers. Different commentaries have varying understandings on how much was gathered or how many were killed, but it's clear that they killed without discretion. Each person had 10 homers. A homer was about as much as you could load on to a single donkey, and even if each person was only referring to one person for each household who killed the quail, that would still be well over a thousand dead birds per household. This is well beyond what could be consumed. The text is clearly stating that they killed beyond what was reasonable, even if one truly believed they did need to eat meat to survive. It would seem that the Israelites did not consecrate themselves. How could one consecrated to God indulge in this irreverent, excessive, wasteful, and violent behavior? There's no way they were simply killing the quail in order to survive. And there isn't even a way they could have eaten that much quail. It reveals that they had not learned the lesson of the manna, to trust God for the da their daily needs by only taking what they needed. 
Walter Brueggemann describes this behavior of taking more than one needs and not trusting in God and God's abundance as the result of believing the myth of scarcity. The lesson of the manna was to help the Israelites learn to trust in God and God's faithfulness and God's provisions. But instead they lamented the, the manna, asked again for meat, and this time indulged in selfish and short-sighted behavior that caused unnecessary animal suffering. This, dif this behavior was not without consequence as a plague entered the camp as a result. In reference to this account, Dr. Greg Boyd quotes James 1, 14 to 15. After desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Also in reference to this account and cross-reference with Psalm 106, 15, Boyd says, There can come a time when God, with a grieving heart, gives rebellious people what they ask for, leaving them to experience the destructive consequences of their ungodly cravings. I think at this point it's important to look back at, to a part in the text that occurs right before the first account with the quail. In Exodus chapter 15, just after the Israelites left Egypt, the text records a decree of the Lord. Verse 25 reads, If you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, and give heed to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will not bring upon you any of the diseases that were brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. I wonder, as the people went from groaning about not having meat to moaning from eating too much meat, if they remembered these words with trepidation. I wonder if they thought back on God's promise to keep them from disease as long as they did what was right and realized as the plague spread amongst the people that they must have made a grave mistake. The text records that that place would become known as Kabroth Heteva, or the place with the graves of those who craved other foods. I don't believe God wanted them to eat the quail. He wanted them to be sustained by the manna. I don't believe God wanted them to become sick. He wanted them to consecrate themselves and do what was right. In conclusion, we've looked into the two narratives that speak of God providing quail for the Israelites and have found some common theme themes. In both instances, the people are being ungrateful and short-sighted when they speak of wanting to eat meat. In both circumstances, death or desiring, desiring death is mentioned before death comes to the quail. And in the second account, death not only comes to the quail, but also comes to the people by disease. In both instances, the people, not God, are the first to bring up meat. In both instances, manna can be understood to be God's initial plan and ideal. In both times, God accommodates the people's desire to have meat. The final thought I'd like to leave with is this. Have we learned from this account recorded in scripture? Are we any better today? Or are we perhaps repeating these same sins? Are we thankful for the plant foods available for us today? Or are we still demanding that which we don't need? Are we letting ungodly desires take precedence over the sanctity of life? Are we putting our desire to eat meat above chasing after and representing God's ideals, such as compassion, mercy, and nonviolence? The result of the ancient Israelites' sin was plague. Could some of the world's future viral outbreaks and foodborne terminal diseases be avoided? if only we changed our ways and stopped demanding that which we don't need? Or must we continue to unnecessarily demand animals on our plate? And what about the long-term environmental impact of eating animals at the rate we do? Are we thinking of the next generation, or are we being short-sighted yet again? When, I ask the Christian specifically, when will we put God's ways above our own and get a distaste for death between our teeth? <laughs>